let's work backwards. Yeah. You've got a PTSD diagnosis. Tell me about that first. You know, what are the symptoms and how does it affect your daily life? Okay. Um, so for me, when I got that diagnosis, it was, it's a label, number one. Um, number two, I was thinking about what am I going to do for the rest of my career? Um, and number three, I was like, where do I go to from here? Um, so for me, you know, like with PTSD, the, you know, you, the DSM-5 that psychologists and psychiatrists will diagnose you with, you meet, you know, you meet all those certain criteria or a certain number of them. But I do think it's very individually based and the trauma specific that you have as well as also what triggers you and that's different for everyone. So for me, um, oh, I was in a constant state of hypervigilance um hypersensitivity as well which goes tell and tell type of vigilance um i noticed i was overthinking absolutely everything so if, you know being hyper vigilant you're looking for that next threat response and so for me the threat response would come from any day-to-day -day interactions with people even getting on a bus you know i've got i catch a bus to work you know now um in brisbane and you're looking around and you're thinking is that person okay is this person okay is everything all right and that constant overthinking of every single um, situation that you're in, because you're looking for, you know, a, um, a way out of something, you know, you're catastrophizing everything, I guess. So for me, I'm always looking worst case scenario, about nearly every single thing I'm dealing with. And I've managed it pretty well um, up until now. But when you notice that you're doing that so much, it starts to take day-to-day um, -day pleasures out of every single thing. Um, for me, it's a concentration thing as well because your brain, you know, you have so much adrenaline and cortisol going yeah. and you're constantly looking around, you're trying to do work or, you know, you're trying to study as I'm going to be embarking on next year to sit down for like a solid 50 minutes without yeah. getting distracted by different things or who's coming in the room or doing that. It, it, that is one of the biggest things that I've noticed, the biggest change in me um, and the self doubt. So even like, so having that diagnosis, I knew something wasn't right anyway. Um, and then when you had that label on yourself, I really started to self-doubt myself. And then the overthinking came in um, with, can I do this? Am I capable of doing this? Oh God, can I go up to the shops at this time? Or can I walk the dog? Is, is there going to be an issue with another dog? And we'll obviously go into that a bit further and why I've got an issue with dogs. Um, but for me, it's, I guess I sometimes I explain it when I do some public speaking about being a prisoner of the mind. And... Yeah your rational side of your brain really does know that there's, you know, you're okay, you're in a normal situation, everything's all right, but your, your fight or flight and your limbic system in your brain is just in overload. And I guess for me, when you've got, you know, you, your two sides of your brain really aren't communicating that well, or well, one's trying to, and the other one's a million miles ahead, it, you feel like you're trapped. And I've always felt like, um, you know, for about three years, that sometimes I'm a prisoner of my own mind. And um, it's exhausting. Yeah. It, um, it really wears you down. And for me, um, I, you know, every now and then I'll get a little bit depressed about it. Um, and I guess, you know, you, when you hear, a, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is sometimes you look at it as a, a, you've got a disorder or you get diagnosed with, with a disease. And a lot of the time, sometimes, you know, diseases are curable. And unfortunately with PTSD, it's a chronic illness and you've got it for life. And knowing that that, you know, is a life sentence in some ways, um, every now and then I catch myself and I think, oh, how am I going to live with this for the next, you know, however long I'm going to be alive on this planet and have a happy, happy life. And so I've done a lot of, you know, therapy and peeling back a lot of layers and I, you know, exercise a lot of the time, um, try and watch my diet and how I sleep and, that can go on and on and on, but sometimes you need more than that because your brain, your neuro, you know, your neurotransmitters, your chemicals are all out of whack. And you know, I'm actually at the point in my life now where I have to go on some medication to be able to assist me because I can't do it myself. And what's weird is like if, if I was talking to anybody else, and this is where this self doubt and your self esteem because it, it's taken a massive hit. And I would think to everyone else, you know, get that medication. It's going to help you. It's going to do this. But when it comes to myself, I've been fighting this probably for the last 18 months and I feel like I'm giving in or I'm the PTSD is taking over 
I'm, you know, I'm sort of um, waving my white flag and I'm surrendering to it. But it's just at a point now where I really can't handle it on my own without some help from medication. And that, like just talking to you now, because it's quite, it's a new thing for me that I'm going to have to do it. Um, I feel like I'm being, a, you know, and this is me personally, anyone, anyone else that was doing this, I, I would never think they were weak. I would never think that, um, you know, there's something wrong with them and they're doing the right thing for themselves. But when it comes to myself, I'm that critical. And that's another thing that is... Um, I noticed is that inner critic that you have in myself since that um, incident and having that diagnosis I've been harder on myself and it's also come out in other ways and other symptoms with me mm. with um, uh, body image and how I'm looking um, my perfectionism as well so I, I've almost become obsessed with being perfect at everything and that's you know it's an anxiety based thing as well you know and um, it's quite a personal thing but one of the things that I really did notice was looking at myself in a mirror. I'd start to see something else that was there and it sounds a bit weird, but that's that overthinking in your mind. And my mind's constantly playing um, catch up with each other. A bit of, you know, a bit of dysmorphia was coming in there. I've obviously um, been dealing with it, but that's one of the different symptoms for me that has come out. Not everyone with PTSD would have that, but that's, that's a symptom specific for me. And, um, and the, you know, after doing some therapy with a psychiatrist and psychologist, they said it's a control thing for you. It's some way that you can gain some sort of control and that perfectionism is control and it's also a distraction, um, but it is exhausting. Yeah. But, you know, the things that kind of struck me from, from what you said about that is obviously exhaustion. And, and look, I kind of, I get that part. I would never say I get the whole thing. Okay, for complete clarity, I'm just talking what. You know, you, you come home from a shift that's, that has been dangerous where you've gone to high-risk situations and, you, and you're doing that all the time. Like, you are exhausted. You have run a mental marathon. So if that is happening to you constantly, like, that marathon never ends, like, that would end up taking over your life as you've kind of indicated as to what's happened. And then, then you go on this <laughs> kind of self-doubt thing. You go, well, this is not who I am. Yeah. I, I am not that person. That, that's not me. That's that's so you know all these all these questions about self image and identity and and of course us being in the police like well me, me ex copper but like you know you still being in the job. Um, it, it's like again that's not who we are. We're the people that come in and sort those kind of situations. Um, and yeah, sticking that label on your sticking that label on yourself. That's that's and then then getting angry with yourself for feeling this way. Or I agree with myself that, you know, you can't concentrate for that period of time. Yeah. I was so much better at doing this. Why am I doing this now? But what's interesting is when I'm working and I'm dealing with people on the job, I'm obviously very hypervigilant, which isn't, you know, necessarily a bad thing. Because That's I'm not bad. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm never complacent. But with that becomes, and I'm very protective over other people that I'm working with and in, in general, in, in the public, like even catching the bus, you know, if I see someone struggling with their shopping bags or something I'm so attuned to I'm like are you okay or grab a seat here you know and that's you know that's just being a, a good human as well but it gets to that point where you're constantly doing it and everyday yeah. activities become so yeah it, it um it's exhausting but it, it at the same time there are a lot of positives that can come from as well which obviously we'll go on and speak about but for me um it's that sense of control that you mm don't have that you start to exhibit in other areas that you you have in your life i guess absolutely and that totally makes sense and where i'm going to kind of so we've spoken about that from the personal side of things and you mentioned a little bit how it's kind of helping in some ways professionally but policing is a profession that really doesn't deal well with anything that could be interpreted as vulnerability we don't do vulnerability. pardon me for using the wrong way but you know i was in for 30 years so we don't do vulnerability um, so tell me how having this diagnosis has affected, you've kind of talked about how it's affected your self-image. How has it affected your career? Well, for me, I'm very fortunate in that fact that I have been very supported by um, the organisation I work for. Um, and my original, when I joined the job, I wanted to do all the, you know, the Gucci jobs that everyone wants to do, like sort of like the movies, you know, like all 
go into a tactical role or work with canine or, you know, undercover or something like that, all the, the roles that sound, you know, sexy as you want to call it. Um, so for me, how that has affected me, that's um, those sorts of roles are out of the question. Um, and I think not having that control over that or having that choice is another thing that really does upset me, but it is what it is. And I, you know, I, I do hate that saying, but it is what it is at the, at the moment for me. So my career has gone on a totally different trajectory. And when one door shuts, um, I've had five more open. And so for me, I've had to relocate from where I was. I was in Canberra and general duties and um, ACT policing. And I, you know, I miss that every day. I, I love that area um, of the AFP that we have. And they are amazing people that work there. And I miss that, that sort of part of it. But now I'm up here in Brisbane and, and I'm starting to reestablish those sorts of um, connections. And I'm a really good area that I work with now. Um, and I'm having to relearn everything. And, and as I'm, you know, still doing EDMR therapy on the side, like I'm trying to rewire my brain from that threat response as best as possible and then also learning a new role which is in, in national and I find it's difficult but at the same time I feel like my career is progressing in this sense but in a totally different way um for me with the my vulnerabilities it also is where I've found a lot of my hidden strengths to be honest and that's why I do a lot of public speaking because I want people to feel like I've 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 hit rock bottom and people can hear me in my most vulnerable state, which we'll go on and, and speak about a bit later. And so for me, that was um, a changing point for me in the sense that it, it, I can't, like I'm, with what happened, it, it left me very um, raw, if that makes sense. And it, it, it was at a point where um, I guess, you know, that sense when you learn in, in, in training and in college, you do leave your ego at the door um and you're supposed to and sometimes that's a bit hard and I guess for me now there's no other choice I have to leave that ego at that door because I had the biggest piece of humble pie in my entire life um personally professionally um and spiritually I guess um for me but that's also where I found my hidden strength and when I'm dealing with people I um am almost more empathetic now and I know I am and I'm a lot I was always a kind and empathetic person but now it's at a a whole nother level that when I go in and, and dealing with people, um, it's given me a, a, a better way to communicate with people and I'm a lot slower and I take my time with things and I explain things to people. And I've, I've honestly seen a better result in just my deal to deal dealing with um, people on the job, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. And, uh, and indeed, we're gonna, we're gonna lead into that because it's, it's just too interesting not to lead into it right now. So what I'm kind of hearing is these experiences have broken you down. Um, you've kind of explained what broken means to you, but you, you can go into it more if you like. But here's the thing about being broken down. It gives you the ability to rebuild yourself. And that means that it's not all bad uh, because it's an opportunity for growth. So, like, we have, you know, we say post-traumatic stress disorder, but the post-traumatic stress growth is a real thing. And there are some positive effects to this. And I'd really like you to talk about the positive effects, the growth and what, besides this uh, empathy, uh, knowing that you're no better than the person that you're dealing with. T t talk about that. Um, so I guess how I sort of, with my recovery and what was happening with me, I didn't realise what I was doing um, was actions of post-traumatic growth. Um, so for me, how that, all that started was once, um, you know, I sort of was injured in the job, I had a lot of amazing people um, come to me and show me a lot of kindness and compassion and care. And where that started, I, I noticed that I weeded out the people um, in my life in total, to be honest, who aren't genuine and really aren't there for me. But then I started seeing um, and being truly grateful for the people who I had in my life. And, you know, and, and I think every human being on this planet can say that at one time or another they've taken people for granted and for me I refuse to do that now and really seeing people for who they are and appreciating their strengths rather than focusing on their weaknesses yeah. um and that to me is a true definition of kindness anyway but I noticed I started doing it I was like I really like this about this person or I really like that strength about this person and I started um having the ability to to ask for help from certain people who I could see um were 
um, it sounds selfish in a way, but they were giving me strength. They were giving me um, purpose. They were helping me with, you know, strategies and where to go to from there. And so for me, when I started seeing that and being, um, seeing what people would offer me, that um, was where I started to make some steps in the sense of my recovery and where to go. Um, and what I noticed was people who had gone through trauma are the ones that I understand it the best the most. And they were the people that kept coming to me, but they're also the people who I started, you know, I started seeking out for help. And so for me, when I, I you know, I've had bad days, particularly when I was in Canberra, I'd make some phone calls and particularly to uh, one of my very good friends. Um, and he said to me, what you're feeling is normal. Yeah. And when you think that you're not normal, like the, and the issue is, and that was the other thing, so I didn't say before, for me, one of the biggest things I noticed is the paranoia that you have from all the overthinking because you're looking for this next threat. Your brain's looking for it, but, you know, there's no threat around you. You're, not, you're in a safe environment. Everything's all right. When you start looking for things like that, it's when it can take the enjoyment out of everything. And so um, for me, how I noticed was that help that those people gave me. Once I was at a level where I started to feel a lot better, um, I did a presentation at um, the police college and I explained to them what had happened to me but I was so raw about it I said this is where all my faults and where I went wrong because I wanted people to learn from it and one of those things of, of sharing those vulnerabilities and sharing things that you have done wrong or you could have done better so people can learn that there is a, a, an excellent example of post-traumatic growth in the sense that I was like okay as long as, as I can make purpose from this or we can learn from this situation and share it with a lot of people for me it gives makes sense that this has happened but you know let's turn let's make lemonade out of lemons in that sort of sense and, and that gave me purpose and you know obviously I was still struggling along the way but I've obviously had to do a lot of therapy and one of them was um I EDMR therapy which is eye movement desensitization um, memory reprocessing and for me at the start I thought this is a bit of hocus pocus when I started doing it it unlocks so many blocked memories in your mind that you haven't dealt with. And almost this attack, which will happen to me is the worst thing, but it's also the best thing because I started peeling back all the layers of things that I hadn't, you know, sort of dealt with. And everyone, no matter what you are, you know, where you come from or what, what country, we all have issues that have happened to us. We've all had trauma. That's what life is, unfortunately. But I started peeling back things that I hadn't really dealt with. And when I was doing that, I, I it was scary at the time. But it's almost like you've got this massive backpack that you've, you know, dealt with all your life and it keeps adding up and adding up and adding up. And unfortunately, mine just exploded and I had to deal through it and sort it all out. But that is where I got my significant growth from. Like I, I was also treating this, but I was treating some things that I hadn't really known about prior. Um, and that there was growth for me. I, I, I peel back layers of things that, you know, you bottle up for so long and you, you don't realise what's happening and it it's made me a better person for it. You know, I'm still going. I'm, I'm still having to receive help now. But um, I think having, you know, I'm so fortunate in the fact that I work for an organisation that, you know, supported me and I, you know, I had a, I had a con care claim and I was able to get that help and, and, not a lot of people, you know, have that opportunity. I'm not talking just emergency services or anything like that. And I guess I'm so fortunate and that's why I want to give back and it's, you know, paying it forward, I guess, in the sense that I want people to not see mental health or a mental health diagnosis as a dirty word. And because I felt it was a dirty word and I had a lot of shame with that and I felt like I was weak and I, would you know, put the white flag up as I am sort of today talking, you know, you know, I'm, I have to go on medication. I need a bit of help because I can't do it alone. I'm trying everything. And I guess that paying it forward for people to learn um, from my mistake, from my mistakes or lived experience. And I think that gives me a sense of growth in itself. And it's also a very vulnerable thing to do. But for me, with, with what happened to me, it was a life-changing event in the sense that I've, I, you know, uh, like the audio, if you want to speak about that um, next, when that was made public, I um, was ex extremely embarrassed about that. And I, I listened to it. I had to listen to a court when I gave my victim impact statement. And for me, I, um, I can't listen to it. 
Um, I, I, don't, I don't ever want to listen to it ever again. And if it's ever played, I'll, I'll leave the room. If I do a presentation, it depends on obviously the audience. I'm doing it as a, as a learning thing. But um, I guess when, like, it's terrible. I, don't, um, it's, I literally, oh, I thought I was going to die. And it, it went from being angry to sheer terror and I'm screaming in absolute terror. And knowing that the whole world at any time can hear that um, at a time when your whole soul was stripped bare is yeah. a very um, scary thing, but it's also a very powerful thing because I thought I've got nothing to lose anymore. And when I started doing these presentations, it was almost like I was owning it. And for me, that has given me a sense of strength and a, and a, and a sense of purpose to keep going because I... There was no, I was back, my back was against the wall, if that makes any sense. It and makes total sense because, like, you know, the recurring worst nightmare that everyone has, and, and you even see it on TV nowadays, where that nightmare where you're in front of a crowd and you're naked and, <laughs> and everyone starts laughing. Yeah. Well, you know, when you've been stripped absolutely psychologically nude, naked, you know, there's... <laughs> And everyone, like you said, everyone can can hear it. Everyone can can see it. And it's like, well, all the masks, all the clothes that I wear, all the masks that I put on, gone, all of it. And um, and to and then to know that about yourself, and then have all this, mate. It's it's it, honestly, it's it genuinely is inspirational. And we we will. I'm going to jump a little bit ahead, and I'm going to say something like you you deservedly won a bravery medal for what you did, and and. You know, in one of the very brief conversations that we've had before this, you said, you know, I still kind of don't think I deserve it. Well, let me tell you, you do. Um, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a 30-year veteran. Um, so you, you earned that. Let me tell you that for no charge. I know you're still dealing with the trauma when you got the award. And, and in some ways, it kind of added from the conversation. And then I'm paraphrasing the conversation. I've had, tell me if I get it wrong. But it added to your feelings of embarrassment because you, you kind of felt like you didn't deserve it. You had these mixed feelings and you were standing next to the, you know, the, the, the Thai divers and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, again, you deserved it, but tell me what was going on in your head at that time. A lot of mixed emotions at the time. I um, It felt very surreal, the whole thing, and I, I still was dealing with, obviously, a lot of trauma. I had a psychological injury at the time, and... For me, it was almost, um, it was recognition, but I was shoved into the limelight. I guess um, I felt on the day, I didn't, I I thought I could have done a lot better. You know, those are things in my head that I was like, I should have just done this and none of this would have happened. Or if I'd done this, none of this would have happened. But at the same time, um, one part of me was my mom and my grandmother and my auntie and you know all my, are going to be so proud of me and they're so happy for me and that that was a sense of pride in that sense I was glad that that was something for them do you know what I mean like yeah. you know in a in a nice way but on the other half it was like I was extremely hyper vigilant and hypersensitive at the time and you sort of been put in the spotlight because I wasn't in the job for a very long time and as I said I'll I was constantly looking for that next threat response and so the next threat response for me was like Oh my god! What if people think that I don't deserve this? What if they, what if I, what if they think that I'm, you know, weak enough? Or why? Why has she got it? Why are this? And you know, none of that was probably really happening. And it, it, what? And you know what? What other people think about me isn't really any of my business. And I'm slowly trying to learn that. Um, but so for me, I, I, I guess in a very brutal way, because I was so terrified on that day, and I thought I was going to die. I but how can you give someone a bravery medal when they were um, absolutely terrified? Yeah, because because you don't get terrified. So yeah, I'm, you you didn't feel brave. No, you didn't feel brave at the time. Like you know, it wasn't. Yeah, no. Yeah, and here here are these here here are these other guys. But look again for what it's worth. I've you know I've given I've given information to to our honours and awards mob to uh, to assist people to to get. Uh, to get decorations and um, again for what it's really, is important. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, well, you know, I, you know, I've seen things or I've, I've been there, or you know, someone's come and said, "Hey, you know, I think this person deserves a decoration," and I've gone, "Yeah, 
and I provided I provided information for that. So again, for what it's worth, I, I genuinely think I genuinely think it's um, you you weren't that like make, make no mistake. And and we've all been terrified. You know what I mean? What job? Because everything's on footage now. What job have you not been to? Like there's no copper in the world, no emergency, and it's okay. We're copper, so we're talking about that. But a complete clarity, like. Big shout out to all our brothers and sisters in the other emergency services. So all the AMBOs, the fireys, people are working in emergency, in the emergency world, the hospitals. It's the same thing for you. We get it, okay? We're not, we're not pretending that we want to monopolise this because we don't. Um, but, but kind of like you, you don't feel that, that, oh, sorry, anytime that you do a job, when you're looking at the footage afterwards, you kind of look at it and go, man, I should have done that. Oh, oh no. my God. What, how could I miss that? Like, yeah, you know, how could I miss that threat cue? How, why was I not watching his hands? What the, what the hell was I thinking? Like, you know, and, and, and look, you get, there are world-class boxers who win gold medals. They watch their, all their fights later. And I've seen on Netflix and stuff like that, they do some of the, um, some of the documentaries you watch. And these guys watching their own fights who are, they're world-class. There's no better. And they go, oh, they're slapping their heads going, oh, I'm such an idiot. Oh my God. I'm yeah. so pathetic at this sport. I'm so bad. I'm so, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, no, that's not the way it works. And and hindsight's a beautiful thing as well. Oh, I mean, we've all got we've all got PhDs in that. And yeah, you know, be, being a supervisor, being an ex supervisor, and being because I was peer support as well. But what I used to find was people just wanted to come up and they because for some reason or other they looked up to me. I mean, if you know me, <laughs> me, why, why are you talking to me? But. <laughs> People come sort of sliding up and go, oh, Sarge, you know what, Matt, you know, I went to this job and this happened and blah, 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 blah. And the outcome was this. And, you know, I felt like I stuffed this up or, you know, and, you know, man, it was really bad. And, and, and what I learned from listening to God, I, I mean, I don't know how many times that that happened, you know, like hundreds probably, you know, I don't think I'd be exaggerating in saying that. Um, and sometimes they'd kind of like, they'd lost their temper or, and I, I would just say at the end, you know what? I understand exactly why you did that. And I don't think I would have done any different or I don't think I would have done any better. And you just see these people just go, oh, God, you know, thank you. Because, uh, again, as, as coppers, we know that, like, if it's the use of force, other people are going to be looking at it, stroking their beards and going, oh, I could have, should have, would have. You know that there's going to be some lawyer, there's going to be some judge who's never seen an angry man in their life. Some journo could have, should have, would have. You yeah. know what I mean? But that's, you know, Matt, that's the thing. That's the power of validation and making someone feel validated that, you know, it's okay. You don't change a thing. This is, you know, that that's fine what you've done or the could have, should have, would have. And, and when someone is has a psychological injury in particular and that vulnerable and when you give them that validation, that is honestly like a, a golden ticket in that sense and that's what I was saying those people that would come to me who had been through stuff and you know and I'd make those phone calls and it'd be like this is okay this is completely normal that validation for me yeah. just was so comforting in the sense that I'm not alone and I guess that's the other thing why I want to have these conversations you know particularly with someone like yourself like I felt truly alone and when you're a prisoner of the mind and you're constantly in this state you you literally felt like you know, you're, you're on the outside looking in, like you're very vulnerable and isolated and um, on your own. And I think when you hear other people say, oh, I've been like that as well, or I felt like this, or that's, you know, that's okay to feel like this. It is honestly so comforting and it really helps with people's recovery and to build their confidence back up. And that validation is what I think um, a lot of people need. And it's a very overrated um thing that can improve someone's sense of self yeah yeah it's and, and look and i totally get this is not mocking the courts and this is it's going to sound like it is but i swear to god my intention is is not not to mock them is not to mock um uh, anyone else because i understand the police need to be held accountable like that needs to happen mm. so part of our job is having to suck up they could have should have would have and get a lot of people kind of, kind of saying that and anytime that like when I've been sitting there in court for a use of force, like for a challenged use of force and stuff like that. And, you know, it's like, Oh, why did you handcuff my client? You know, why did you do this? Why did you, why did you headlock him? Why did you, you know, why did, why, 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 why? I've never got in trouble for anything I did. Not once. 
What I did get in trouble for is what I didn't do. You know what I mean? They kind of try to change the paradigm. It's like, oh, you did this. Yes, why did you do that? Oh, well, the use of force model, blah, 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 threat cues, yada, yada, yada. And after, after about 10 years, I got pretty articulate at it. It's like, yep, this, blah, 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 blah. And you'd see these lawyers going, oh, yeah, okay, no worries. Why didn't you do this? And then it's like, that's when I knew, you know what I mean? Like it's all the, and I don't blame the judges and the magistrates for doing that because, uh, again, they're kind of like asking, you know, why instead of headlocking, you know, why, did, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And thank God I never had to, um, you know, I never had to use any, uh, well, you know, I never ended up in coroner's court. Thank God. That, those are the questions that they kind of like, and, and I'd be sitting there in the box going, well, I didn't, you know, you just end up having the same, oh, I just didn't, you know, I didn't think of that. Oh, you didn't think of that? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what I want? In, in, in the hundredth of a second that I had to respond, and we're always responding to situations too. Like, it's not as if, like, it's very, it's very rare. Like, the cert guys, maybe, and they plan that. They plan that. It's like, okay, the offender's over there. He's got this, this, and this. Um, and, and again, like, it's highly dangerous what they do, but they get to act. They're the ones on the front foot. They're the ones that get to, they're the ones, right, we're going to go in, we're going to smash this guy. He's, he's not going to know. Well, he, he knows, we may know, he knows we're coming, but, like, we are, we are the ones that are controlling this. Whereas if you're a GD's copper or you're, you know, executing warrant or whatever it is, you don't know what's going to happen. And action always beats reaction. Always. And you're always on the back foot, you know, you're always, you're reacting. And man, that, that kind of, I always felt like, and again, I totally understand that people, that police should be held accountable. And I think it's so important, you know. I think, um, because we're but, held at a higher um, level, particularly of integrity and in how, you know, uh, our stance in the community, which I, um, you know, I swore an oath and I believe that um, very strongly. I think that pressure as well when I return to duty um, and feeling still vulnerable, that's also a compounding thing as well because sometimes, uh, particularly before I went back operation when I was um, okay, I um, I used to question myself, can I still do this? Can I Thanks. still look after the community? Am I at the best of my ability? You know, am, am, I, am I safe? Is anyone going to want to work with me? And different things, that all went through my head as well. What I've noticed is I've, as I have come back and I, you know, I've warmed up into it. Um, I know that everyone's safety, the person I'm dealing with and, you know, my colleagues is paramount. And I always, when I'm dealing with anyone in my work, um, I start down here. Cause there's only one way to go. Mm. Um, if you start up here. So for me, having that empathy, and um, reading a situation and understanding um, when people are, you know, in a time in crisis or they're, they're stressed or they're uncomfortable, I always try and be as empathetic yeah. as possible. And you know what I've noticed? That it has improved every single situation I've been in. And that is one of the gifts of what happened to me. Yeah. And I've said um, so many times, like to so many people, embrace those vulnerabilities because that is honestly where you'll find your hidden strength. And when you start to face them and work on them, um, you're unlocking a, a piece of your um, personality or your sense of self that truly is amazing. And that's why I keep trying to encourage people to, um, to do that. Yeah. And I think is um, particularly with police, early intervention is so important. And I think the more we talk about this and the more people lived experience speak about these certain things, it, it, it in a sense normalizes it so that people can feel comfortable to go and get help because, you know, I, I, in one way, I'm very lucky. Like mine wasn't an accumulative trauma. It was a very, it was a, cri a critical um, situation. It was very, um, it was very violent and very horrific. But at the same time, it was, it was that, you know, there's obviously a couple of things before and after, like I was in a, in a car accident on the way to hospital to get my second surgery. And um, I know I must have um, done something in a previous life that was very lucky. So I had a, a run of unfortunate events that had come up. Um, but the people who have accumulative trauma and the ones that don't see that this is affecting them or they're just so preoccupied, um, I just want everyone to 
feel comfortable to be like, if you're not sleeping for the next few hours or if something's not right or if you need to debrief, debriefing is so important um, for anyone in any job or anything that's stressful, even if you're in a car accident, like if it shakes you up, like that's what, that's what our brains are designed to do to protect us. And if you're not feeling okay, the earlier you go and do it and the earlier you um, get those tools that help and you don't necessarily have to have medication but just talking to, to a counsellor or talking to a friend or talking to someone about it it is honestly the earlier the better it is for you to, to recover and I, I really want to stress that and that's why I'm you know doing all this uh, public speaking is to raise awareness for that and I always yeah. want people to know it's because you have a diagnosis of PTSD you know and some people Unfortunately, they're at that point where they have to med medically retire and that's okay as well, you know, and I, I don't want, um, I want to validate that as well. Like it, it, I'm lucky that I'm not at that level yet. I'm, I'm, I'm doing very well and I'm managing very well, um, but I also have that support, but I'm also very early on in my career and I was only in the job 18 months and this happened, but. Um, you got to know you use, you got to know you use by date. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, but at the same time, I also want people to know that just because you're suffering anxiety or you're, you don't necessarily have to have a label of PTSD, like you have acute stress or you have like pressures at home or stresses and, and things that can compound, um, it's okay to not be okay. And mm. the more we talk about things like this, and the more, more we show people um, some tools or what's helped for, for me might help for someone else or they might not, um, I think that is um yeah very important absolutely and, and like you said it kind of and if you think of what we do because i spent a, a, a short time uh, as a as a designated investigator I, did, I didn't get my appointment but um i had to hold a plain closed position for a while and part of my remit not specifically but part of it was um of, uh, was sex abuse investigations and you talk to a lot of these you know horribly victimized women and you'd see the self-blame come in where some of them would go, oh, you know, I, I didn't fight. And I'm going, well, that doesn't mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so you get, you know, you'd have, you'd have these people asking, asking these questions. Like it's a violence as well, Matt. Like, if, sorry for to interject. And that's what you see with DV victims as well, is that self-blame and what that, what comes with that blame is shame. I think blame and shame are, are, are particularly when, you know, you've been victimised, they're, they're two overlapping things that sometimes you can't separate. And it's like one's a symptom of the other or that brings on the other. And that shame is where that um, embarrassment and that, that blame comes from. And, it, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, unfortunately, mm. sometimes, particularly if you don't um, validate it and get, early intervention and, and you're right I, I find a lot of police blame themselves as we were discussing before it's the same sort of thing um yeah if that made yeah okay so we spoke a lot about the outcomes and um look if, if you're up to it um would you mind telling us what happened and and if you're not like or you know you want to just that's all right um so in a nutshell, um, in 2018, I was um, responding to um, a normal theft job um, in Canberra and um, I was with um, my sergeant and um, an, an acting sergeant um, and we responded to that theft and um, he stole an, uh, an elderly lady's mobility scooter actually. So we were um, very keen to get it back. It was, we, um, it was funny, we actually had a conversation beforehand. We were like, yeah, we'll, we'll get the scooter back and we'll write it down to her she because you know that was her um independence you know and we, we spoke to her first and I was like we're gonna get this thing back it was just you know it was a Sunday morning we're keen to get in there we found out where it was and who it was and and when we went there um the offender set his um American people onto myself and um the, my sergeant the senior Connie I was working with and um you know we it started off, I was so angry when that dog got out. I just, I can still, to hear this day, like hear that um, growl and that rumble when that screen door flew open. I knew he had held that door open. And, um, you know, we emptied three cans of spray on the dog. My sergeant deployed two taser cartridges and um, it tried to bite um, one of my 
um, my partners I was with. So I sort of wanted to distract the dog from him because it was jumping up and I've run towards it. And um, just, you know, that's the last thing I wanted to see was see someone um, get injured like that. And I just ran towards it, ran in front of him and um, the dog launched itself at my hand. Um, we wrestled for a while and I actually tried to spray the dog um, in the face because I still had my spray in my hand, but I ended up, um, this is another blame thing. I, I'm so embarrassed about this, but you know what? I sprayed myself in the face with OC spray. <laughs> We've all done it. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, the time and place when a dog's yeah. you know, ripping at your hand and now you can't see. So yeah. well, I, I get it. I get it. Seriously. I get yeah. It. And then um, the dog then let go and ran around for my um, calf the first time, my right calf, and then I had a firearm go off. And I honestly thought that um, the offender had a firearm. I thought he was shooting at me because he was yelling at his sister, not hurt his dog. And and then the dog let go and I've run towards a wall. And honestly, part of me wanted to run and hide into that um, screen door that I, I could see there. And I literally just had this voice in my head. And I was like, don't you dare leave your mates. Like I say, don't you dare leave. Don't you dare hide. That's, you know, my looking back, if I, had done that I don't think I'd ever forgive myself but you know what in my right mind I was getting mauled by a dog like it's a very normal reaction to do that <laughs> and so instead I you know decided to stand there and face it and I'm um, uh yeah and the dog just kept running at me all the time and and at that point I remember being against the wall of the apartments and that in the audio I know that that changes and that's when my voice starts to um no I'm screaming in terror and that honestly I just it in it, it happened in about was like two minutes and 45 seconds from memory. And that is a long time when you think about it. But for me, I can still remember yeah. certain images so clear. I remember when this dog was trying to run and jump up, you know, jump up and I wanted to get to my face and get that. And I thought to myself, I was starting to fall back a little bit. And um, I was, it, and you know when you hear people in the movies and they say they had an out-of-body experience? Yeah. I honestly did that day. I was literally watching myself get attacked and that's, you know, after speaking to, you know, medical professionals, that's when your central nervous system is collapsing. It's when you're in complete shock and it's what your body does to protect itself as well. So I was disassociating from it. And, um, and then I thought to myself, well, this is, this is it. I think, I don't think I can take too much more. And that was horrifying in a sense. And I remember when one of the guys that lived in the apartment um, to the left of me, I saw him and I begged him to, to come out and he came out and he, um, pulled the dog off me very quickly and he shoved the dog into the, the apartment that he came out from. And then, um, yeah, I took my glove off and that's when I started to see my hands all move and tendons. And, and because of the dog had um, severed the nerve, my ulnar nerve in my hand, I felt this massive um, fire, this, the pain I've never experienced before in my entire life. I felt my whole hand was on fire <clears throat> and I was just like screaming and screaming to get the ambulance and, and um, I started to go into shock then really badly. And I thought at that time, I remember I, I collapsed on the ground and I was like, someone stand by me. You know, I've got my, my, uh, my firearm there. I was, you know, worried about everyone else, you know, things coming over. And I kept worrying this dog was going to come at me again. And I was on the ground in a very vulnerable state. Um, you know, and the officers there were trying to render first aid. And I was just at a point where I didn't want to see any more injuries because I knew I was in a really bad way. Um, one thing I do... Um, and I'm okay now, but every now and then when I'm speaking about it or every now and then I think about it, I have a, something which is called a visceral reaction. And that day was really cold in Canberra and I was on the ground and I was shaking. Like, it, I, you know, the other officers that attended, it really shook them up. Um, yeah. And it would have, to be honest. So if it was anyone else, I'd be like, oh, my gosh. Like, I was in that much show. I was just shaking and I kept saying sorry to everyone. And I was just like, I'm so sorry because I literally thought I was being so weak you know what I mean? Because yeah. my brain went to disassociate. I really didn't realize the gravity of it. Like I, 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 know I thought, oh my gosh, you're screaming out. Like it's just a scratch. You're going to be fine. But I was just in a really bad way. And then not realizing that gravity of it, like of that whole thing was even after I got my bravery medal, like I still hadn't really got the grasp of it. And it took my brain a long time to, to catch up with that. And it's amazing what the brain does to, to go in to protect itself really. Um, and so for me, I went to hospital and I, um, I was, I uh, kept getting bumped for surgery because I had a lot of, um, emergency C-sections come in, but I didn't know the extent of my injuries. And I was nil by mouth for, you know, a couple of days and that was pretty hard. And, 
um, I just knew I couldn't feel my hand. I could barely feel my leg. And um, in the end, I had surgery and I had, you know, 100 to 200 stitches, sorry, in my body. And when I had the surgeon come and see me eventually, he said to me, he's like, it was like I repaired a shark bite. And I obviously hadn't seen the injuries everyone else had. And um, for me, when he said that was when I was like, oh, maybe I'm not being such a sook. Maybe this is pretty serious. And it's just, yes, but that's what, that's, what your brain does when it's mm. gone into complete shock, like it's ridiculous. You know, I'll look back now and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And the turning point for me was when I heard that audio because I hadn't heard it till I went to court. But um, as of like, I, I sort of digress, sorry, but as um, I had that first surgery, my legs started to go necrotic on my right side. It was disgusting. Like it was going black. It was wrong because of the circulation was there. So I had to go get another surgery. And then um. On the way there, I had someone um, from the job driving me and, yeah, we were in a car accident and her car got written off and I was just like, oh, my gosh, you know, like it was just when I went to the hospital and I missed my surgery time and he said, I can either put you in hospital for a few more days or we're going to either skin graft my leg or they were going to try and cut it out. So they ended up cutting out all the necrotic tissue and um, it was just disgusting. I had this open ulcer, you know, in a sense on my leg and... Um, and then my hand was going like a claw, like my hand, if you have a look, I can't, it's, it's, I've had, you know, three procedures on it and it's still curling or whatever. I can't, I can't feel half of that, but you know, like I'm in one good way. I'm so lucky it wasn't my right hand because I'm, you know, I'm right-handed. Um, eventually I've got enough strength back to be able to, you know, pass a, a test and, you know, the dexterity enough to be able to, you know, get back into the job and I still train and, and do certain things but um yeah like it's it's been a long road but I still I'm still working on this and I'm you know I'm I'm lucky to be operational I've had all that support you know to be able to get there but I'm still working on that um yeah that self-doubt and that self-confidence like it, especially with um you know I'll give you an example of public speaking I've started and you know, every time I talk I could get so much from everybody else. And I know it sounds, here's me saying it's to, to pay it forward and get, get, you know, pass things on. But I get so much back in the sense when I, I have people come up to me and they're like, you know, you really helped me with this. I, I should have done this. Or, you know, people just have contacted me and said, I've got this help or I've done this. And that honestly just fills me with such light and happiness that it makes me want to keep doing it. But on the same token, when you're out in the spotlight like that and you're still looking for threat responses, you're like <laughs> talking, you're like, did I say the wrong thing? Have I upset anyone? Did I really do this wrong? Or like, you know, I just started um, more of a sense. I started a, a, a social media page just um, when I do some sort of certain events that I turn up to or different things. And I, um, it's only very new in its infancy. I've only got like three posts or whatever, but I'm going to start building on that. But that... I'll give you the example is that like I'm even overthinking that to that point but I'm working on it and I'm getting there and the thing is is that I people can learn such so much through lived experience for other people and I think it's important that when people come to you and they tell you things like use it move from it yeah absolutely I was just trying to look up your page so I'll get its name <laughs> it's very new and I um yeah, when I do it, I'm I, that and that, um, you know, like I guess um, when people start small businesses and I've, I've got this girl that sort of helped me with um, doing the graphics with it. And I said to her, I was like, I just don't know why, you know, I can't do this. And that's the other thing with having a label with PTSD. When you think, oh, it's got to be my PTSD, that's why I'm overthinking this. And she's like, Carla, everyone thinks like that when they're doing this. Like it's not just <laughs> that. So that's the other flip side of having that label in the sense like I even talked to my sister this morning when I was walking the dog and I was like I just think that I should be much happier or much better and that's that pressure and that perfectionism that I, I suffer from and she's yeah, like yeah. Carla we're all like that mate like <laughs> I don't know anyone that goes there and goes I've just had the best life and everything's great and some people do that's good but she's like ebbs and flows with everything she said I just don't think it's necessarily a PTSD and that is another danger with a label so, and that's the overthinking thing as well. It's 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 hard to distinguish sometimes between like maybe I'm feeling like this because I've you know gone through this trauma and I'm suffering, or maybe it's just because I'm having a bad day and that's it. Yeah, and, and maybe because I'm a, I'm a human being in a tough circumstance. Yeah. 
Oh, so yeah. Um, my, um, Again, you're my thinking about all of that, and it's you know yeah. linking that back with your identity, and oh my god, like you know, yeah, <laughs> my head's gonna my, explode. Like <laughs> my family in particular, just be like, just they always tell me like, just have a laugh, you know. And I guess that was one of the things that got me through my incident was I, I um, and I'll I'll give myself a compliment here. I guess one of the things that I have is probably my sense of humour, and. Mm. I would laugh a lot of things off, yeah. <laughs> but I also, you yeah. know, I have a husband and family that uh, let me know when I'm being a little bit too serious and overthinking. And they're just like, like, relax, like, you know, and have a laugh. And when you, yeah. it's very important Get to have over that. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, it kind of, I, I, I both love and hate. Me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I both love and hate hearing that. It's like I don't need yeah. that. It's like sh shut up, man. Like you know, you need people to ground you a little bit, you know, and that is very important. And that that is why I say to people, um, surround yourself with positive people and genuine mm. people. And um, one of the best gifts that I think this incident has ever given me is I can weed out people when they're not genuine in a heartbeat. Yeah, and that is a strength in itself. Yeah, it really is. And look, um, so. You'd only had 18 months in when you did this. So you, relatively speaking, like I joined when I was 19. Um, like what the song says. I was just about to sing that actually, but anyway, that's uh, <laughs> it's true. I um I wish I had joined a lot earlier, but uh I was I worked in his detention before that. So I guess I've interjected and interrupted you again. It's, um, no, not at all. No, you, you're say. answering my question. So okay, um yeah, that's one of the things that when I'm feeling sorry for myself and it does happen and it happens maybe once a fortnight, you know, that I'll sit there and go, this is why, why me, you know, why did this happen to me? You can keep asking yourself that question, but I do every now and then feel cheated in my career. Yeah. And, and then you hate yourself for asking for, yeah, for yeah. asking that. But, but then it's like, get over yourself, mate. Bad, yeah. You know, bad things happen to good people all the time. Get back up on your horse. And I think that that's resilience and it's, but it's also, um, it, I can't change it. Yeah, and I think for me, right. I, had, I had a lot of people, particularly some bosses in the job, who you know still, you know, call me every couple of weeks to see how I'm doing, and they're, you know, some of my biggest mentors. And and they say to me, they, I've had a, one in particular say, I people didn't think you're going to get back to the job, and not a lot of people would. And I had a a really good investigator the other day say that to me, and that was validating in itself. But I guess. For me, because I was only in the job for 18 months and I have worked my butt off to get into the AFP. Like I studied, you know, a double major at university. I worked in youth detention and I worked hard, like, to get there. And it was, I, I, this is the weirdest thing, but it was my dream to be in the AFP at the age of three. And um, that is, I know, I think because I saw, like, it's not a very good movie for a kid, but I think um, I might have peaked from behind the couch watching Silence of the Lambs with my family. I wanted to be Clarice Starling <laughs> in the FBI. So I don't know. That was just a thing. That I was like, I want to do that. And I've wanted to do it ever since. But um, for me, after that happened, I remember the surgeon saying, you need to prepare yourself because you may not be operational. I just want you to, you know, you know and, that, and that's important, I guess, just to lower your expectations at the base level. So there's only way up from there. But for me, um, I felt really sorry for myself for a few weeks after that. And I thought to myself, what's the alternative if you don't fight for this? When I'm going to be on, um, you know, a pension for the rest of my life and not work? Or I'm going to go back to doing some other job? And I, mm -hmm. I think that was also a protective factor for me. I, because I had worked so hard, I was like, I'm not giving this up that easy. And I think that was one of the driving forces for me to keep going back to work. Um, and to get there and I'm thankful that I have that inner drive and that's I guess another um positive factor that I've got and it's another post-traumatic growth factor as well is that it made me more driven to get back to work well, well, well good on you but um so I mean you, you've seen seeing signs of the lambs but I can't believe what I submitted that <laughs> no that's, that. that's cool but like I mean, you know, and I had know, a, I had an well, FBI there any, there any, yeah. sorry I had an FBI barbie <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah. There's an FBI Barbie? Oh, really? There was. There was. And it was like cop Barbie. And it was just anything police related. I was just pretty driven. I remember like just being with my parents and I'll just see police cars. My, my dad, um, he wanted to be 
I remember him telling me you want to be a police officer. So you're always always looking, you know, and being like, oh, look, you know, there's a police. And it just was something, you know, as little kids, like I love it when little kids come up to you. You know, you, you'd probably know that as GDs and then they come up and they want to get a photo or talk to you. And just that look of um, amazement and all that with me as a kid. So that's one of the, I think that's one of the best job, part of the job is when you've got little kids that come up or you're, you know, you got elderly people and not, you know, I'm the kind of person helping with their bags. Like, I just think that that sort of community engagement and that part of the job is mm. the things that if you can't um, appreciate that fact or, or like that fact of it, like, what else? Yeah. Yeah, just 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 before I got out, actually, it's <laughs> so cool. I haven't told anyone this. Well, I'm talking, I don't know if you like Barbie, so let's swear getting right. No, 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 no. I swear to God, I won't get anyone. <laughs> Is that a Barbie behind you, that big hair? <laughs> yeah, right? No, it's Winston. <laughs> it's Winston. Oh, sorry. I've got to go the other way. It's Winston <laughs> Churchill, um, because I love Winnie. He's he's one of my heroes. And the other one is actually a self-portrait of my daughter, believe it or not. She's oh really? Yeah, I know, but it's not. She's got blonde hair and she's and she teases Rangers. Like she's always teasing me for being a ginger. It's like Aww. indicating indicating to me that um I'm gonna be the first one off to the gas gas chambers once she takes over. Because of my red hair. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, that's her self-portrait. I, I love it. She, she does a great job. But I, I went to um, I went to uh, the Golden Arches and just by myself, and I was just grabbing a coffee. And this this little girl just comes up to me on my waiting queue. And I always wear shorts um, with legs like mine. Why wouldn't you? So she's come up and she's, you know. Like oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> And she's come up and gone, oh, hello, officer, kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, hello. Like, you know, oh, I just wanted to come over and talk. And, you know, I think what you do is great. This kid would have been like five, six, you know what I mean? And, look, I just wanted to say thanks. And, it's, it's you know, you guys are great. And, and she had these chips. And she goes, have one of my chips. Aww. And I'm like, and I'm like oh, okay. Did you take it? Oh, I'm great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm grabbing the chip, man. Oh, I had to go and. I gotta go to the toilet, you know. I'm splashing the water all over the place. That's the same out of the mouth of babes. Oh, yeah. it was, it was, it, I was just like, you know, right there. I just, I felt that. I was like, boom, yeah. yeah. No, it was, it was so cool. That's part of the proud feeling you have wearing that uniform, I think. And I, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, that driving force. I didn't want to give that up. Like, I love yeah. everything. That's why I do it. I swore an oath and it meant something to me. And, yeah. Um, it's a promise to God, you know. Like I, I kind of say, it, I say that to me. Yeah, look, I'm. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it, it's a promise to God. Like yeah. you know, no disrespect to other professions, but like you know, you don't get that when you're an accountant. You know, you don't get that. Like you make a promise to God. Yeah, that's and a some, big. Some people do the affirmation that that's it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, I, 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 yeah, I swear an oath all the time, and yeah, I'm very sentimental traditional and sometimes and that's it's a big deal like yeah. it, it, it's a big deal you know what i mean it's, it's and like, a big, I think, you, know, you hear um people when they say oh it's a calling and some people think this is a bit cliche but i honestly do think it is for a lot of people yeah. um and that's where it can be so hard sometimes i think because it it is not you know it is your identity and I, I did a zoom conference for mental health australia last week um on that and I think when people, particularly the police, have that psychological injury um, and you're fighting it because you, you don't want to lose that part of yourself because it is yep. part of your identity and you don't want to, to um, you know, yeah, that was it. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. I was trying to find um, other stuff. That's I had to really learn my um, technological um, uh, skills there. It wasn't the best. I had my mobile phone and I was my um, one of my best friends was laughing. He said, you kept touching here all the time. But anyway, so, I mean, it's that weird thing when I'm looking at myself. But anyway, I'm getting better at it. Um, but I think uh, when people have that identity, they're, they're so afraid to lose it. And, you know, admitting vulnerability, admitting something that's not right is very hard. And that's why I want to push this issue of, like, it is okay to get early intervention. And I'm very fortunate that the federal police have... have um, I believe, and this is me saying this, and I hope, um, I think that they're very forward in what they're doing at the moment. Um, and particularly with me, they they went outside the box to help me with my recovery. Like I did exposure work with um, uh, AFP National Canine. Um, and 
that was after I'd sort of um, had a few surgeries and I was working back um, part time. I um, was working homicide for a little bit with, you know, really experienced investigators. And that was amazing to see them work and how they did things. And it's really um, kept up my motivation to, to get back to operational. But that exposure work was honestly um, gave me such confidence and it gave me such a thrill um, that we to do work with the canines ended up getting up in a, in a bite arm and that was um in, in the media in canberra as well but i was shitting my pants i'm not gonna lie um <laughs> the language before i did that but uh, the, the guy i was working with we, we did a walk crawl run method and i trusted him you know and trust a big thing particularly when you're feeling vulnerable like you need to be able to trust that person and he he had actually been bitten by a dog um in the job when he was in canine years and years ago and so we had that sort of common um thing there and he he validated me he said oh, that's you know that's terrifying he said that's horrible and i remember him showing his arm he got um uh bitten on the um by one of the bite dogs on the uh tricep i think it was and and i thought that was horrific and he, for him to say to me he said oh, that's nothing compared to yours like it's still that fact of like oh this was actually pretty serious like just yeah. you know that reality yeah it um it validated me you know and then working with the dogs because I always wanted to be a canine handler how ironic and I wanted to do everything in the job you know because I'm just going to live 50 you know 50 lives at the same time but um for me facing that fear and doing that work really empowered me and it it you know gave me some of my power back for myself and doing that I felt alive doing it and I said to him I was like, oh, so scared and he goes you know my mate's said to me oh, I wouldn't even get in that arm and I haven't even been attacked by a dog you know and so I'm like really really was that really cool you know but for me having that such a, a different approach to my recovery like that's it was amazing and it, it um it like I said it, it just yeah empowered me to get you know to have my power back and that's yeah. so important yeah good on you good on you all right well um you know we've we've had all that really cool deep and meaningful stuff so Tell us about tell us about you. Tell us about the family you came from. You know, what in values do they instill in you besides pointing out police cars? Um, you know what? Um, yeah, so for me, I was um, I grew up. I was born in Cairns, into Melbourne. My dad was a pilot, so um, we moved around a lot. I lived um, overseas for a little while. Um, dad worked for Qantas, and then the pilot strikes happened in '89, and you know, that was never really good for any family. So um, he ended up working on Kuala Lumpur. We moved there for a little while, um, traveled the world actually, you know, um, first class as a young girl because dad was a pilot for the, you know, um, international airlines. It was pretty fancy. But then he finally got a job flying back in the country for Royal Flying Doctor Service in Mount Isa. So I went from, you know, high flying to living in Mount Isa, but I, um, I loved it. I went to school there, primary school there. Um, and then moved to towns where my parents got um, divorced. So from there, um, I was yeah, raised by my mother and my grandmother. Um, went to university there, went to a good school there, Pimco High. Um, and actually at my, uh, I nearly pulled out of uni a couple of times. I, I um, had a little bit of self-doubt with different things I wanted to do. And I ended up enrolling in criminology, which I loved. And I had an awesome professor there, Dr. Mark Chong. Um, and at times of self-doubt like you don't normally see this in a, in a lecture at university but he um I was gonna withdraw from the subject I didn't know what I was doing he didn't let me and he's oh yeah I know he wouldn't let me he was relentless and um <laughs> I know but he like would contact me and he helped me get through things and I stuck it out um I'll do like I love criminology I want to go back next year and do postgrad um but he I think saw something in me and I catch up with him when I'm in towns and he is one of my biggest mentors and um, he is, he taught me what paying it forward was because he, he was, he said he was really lazy when he was in university. He was a mat. However, he was a magistrate in Singapore. He, you know, has a PhD in law, like he's a very intelligent man, but he's such a kind man. And um, I said to him, I was like, I'm, I, how can I thank you so much for this? And he said, just pay it forward to someone else. So that is another thing that he taught me that I have done with this. And he, he, um, he might get a bit embarrassed about this, but he's also one of the other reasons why I do this public speaking to give back so people can learn from it. He um, nominated me for an award um, last year, the um, James Cook University Early um, Career um, Outstanding 
the Outstanding Early Career Award, sorry. And um, yeah, I, I was, I got it um, with um, some other people. And that was um, very humbling to have someone of his stature do that for me but, um, with what had happened to me with work. And he, um, yeah, he sort of pushed me. When I met him, I said, I want to get in the Australian Federal Police. And and that was his mission then. He was like, were well, you going to do it? And he kept, you know, pushing me to, 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 to get there. And he, um, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey for the both of us when he says, do you remember when you nearly pulled out of that subject? Yeah. Said, Look at where you are now. So I... People such as him, when I'm feeling to myself, oh, am, I, am I going anywhere? Am I succeeding? Or look what's happening to me. My brain's slow. I can't concentrate. But he's the kind of person that will bring me back to, to square one when he says, do you remember when you nearly pulled out? Mm. Have a look at this. You know, um, my husband hates this word, this journey, but it is a journey. And he said, Did we have a look at this journey until now. And when you're doubting yourself or you're feeling like you, you're, you're a bit lost in where you want to go with your direction, look back to when you first started and then have a look at how far you've come. And when you can see those steps that have been made over that five-year period or that 10-year period, it really does get you thinking, look, I am moving forward. I'm not stagnant. I've done all these things. And it, it um, helps uh, re reinvigorate you, I guess, if that's the, the right word I'm looking for. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, um, I went from Townsville to um, Canberra and I was driving down and, um, oh, I, you know, was very comfortable in Townsville. Um, you know, I had a great job working in the detention centre. I love Aussie youth work. I, lo I love working there. Um, but I, my, my dream was always the federal police. And when I got in, I couldn't believe it. And I was dr driving down and it was so cold. And the, the um, I was driving my Bogan SSU, as everyone used to laugh at me when I went to, <laughs> went to college. And, um, yeah, I felt like a fish out of water there. I... I um, I doubted myself then as well. And that's one of the reoccurring things for me that I try and um, instill in other people when I'm speaking. But I'm, um, yeah, if they can live through, uh, learn from my self-doubting, I do often. Um, yeah, I just remember being there. I got through college and um, started general duties. And I have you ever seen, you would have seen Southlands. It's like the best, I, for me, I reckon it's the best police show in the world, just with how they do it. I just, it, you can relate so much to it. And you, you know how they say it's the um, front row seats to the best show in the world. And when you do GDs, I literally was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. You know, like, and I just remember um, one of the things that just, you know, in like three o'clock in the morning and you, you've gone into this house for either a check welfare or something like that. And, and you look around and you just see how different people live. Yeah. Then you get back in the car and you, you're just silent. And then I just, like, you, you turn to your mate that you're working with and you're like, did you find that food? And you're like, yeah, that was so weird. Like, it's just so, it's eye-opening, you know what I mean? Like, just to see the world. And it's um, taught me a lot, even in my short 18 months. And, you know, I reckon GDs is the hardest job in the world. That's my honest opinion. Um only because I'm a bit biased with it, but it's also the best job in the world, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I'd, I'd have done it. I would, I would have done it for free, actually, for the first 10 years of that. Yeah. Asked me, that had asked me nicely. Yeah. Like, sometimes you're like, can you believe we're getting paid for this? You know? I know. But it's like, um, one of the moments, like when um, we'll make some light humor out of what happened to me, I, I remember like when the dog first got out, and you know, you have the, I had this moment in my head of like, Oh my god, we're gonna call. We're gonna call someone. We're gonna call the police. I am the police. <laughs> How am I gonna deal with this? You know, that's like, and um, you know, I guess that's one of the things. When I, I went to, I was, I was in the army reserves for a very short period of time. I went to Kapuka as an officer cadet. Um, and shortly, it was actually my third shift back after going through the Kapuka is when I got injured, so I had to um uh, withdraw um from there because I, I had to get back to my normal job first before I could do that but I remember one of my corporals saying everyone wants to be an operator until it becomes time to being an operator well that day I can tell you I uh yeah I thought I was pretty cool I'd seen a lot I was very cocky and um as I said that incident was um like having the biggest piece of humble pie of my life but um it is probably like a, yeah it is the best thing that happened to me you sort of humility is a um 
very powerful thing to happen to you, I think. And if uh, embrace it. Yeah, there's, there's this. Um, you can change it for the better. Yeah, there's right. You know, one of Oscar Wilde's um, books is, uh, yeah, he, it's De Profundis, and he's, he's quoting from Proverbs, out of the depths, oh, Lord, I called, I called on you. And it's like, a, you know, there's this beautiful bit in Proverbs where it, it talks about just being at absolute rock bottom, and that's when, that's when things, that's when the light is the brightest. So, look, t- tell us about you. You know, you've mentioned you're uh, you're married. So, look, t- tell us about um, and you've told us about your family before. So, tell us about your family now, your hobbies and your interests. And yeah. Besides, um, um, so, for me, like I, you know, I love exercising a lot. I've just started this. Um, well, I've got um, you know, secondary employment um, approved to to do some public speaking. So, I've sort of started embarking in that. Um, uh, I do work for, I'm contracted to a company called Kino Entertainment in um, Melbourne, but with COVID, everything's sort of been put on hold. Um, so I've done a little bit of, uh, I, I do a lot of volunteer speaking and, and stuff like that, which, you know, like I, I love doing that um, and helping out particularly things like the police forum. Um, I actually spoke at um, the Domestic Violence Coercive Control Networking Dinner that's been happening in Queensland. It's run, was run by DB Connect and White Ribbon. Um, Australia and um, I spoke there um, on different things and you know just going to different events like that and meeting people and people who are trying to make change out of something negative is is um, truly uh, powerful as well like it's it's been amazing I um started the social media thing that's slowly coming along very very slowly but for me um, one of the things one of my goals um is I want to go back to university and study post-grad um, and particularly on post-traumatic growth. And I was thinking about applying for um, just different fellowships and stuff. I want to be able to uh, have a look at different post-traumatic growth programs there are for, particularly for police, because that's obviously where, you know, my passion is um, for people returning to work and obviously different programs and reintegration programs that they have. And because I think, um, you know, we've come a long way in you know 20 years 10 years five years and we're still going it's you know i just i'd like to really contribute to that it's um yeah i think that's my next yeah. passion i'm um, a massive believer in visualization and um in 2015 um i, I was engaged and i'm uh, to put up with my partner then i was a little bit lost but i had a i did up a, a vision board and you know um my brother used to paint me out for it but um, I had all these pictures on there and I, what's funny, I actually had a picture of a, um, like a police dog, like a barking um, police dog. And I sent you the photo today. Yeah. That photo was on that board. It's ridiculous. I was looking at that going, oh my gosh, it's just weird how, you know, yep. that sort of came up and I had, um, you know, getting into the federal police and different things. And I did, um, uh, I was over in the Northern Territory um, last year for 10 months on Op Protect, um, helping NT poll out with um, COVID. And there was a picture of Ayers Rock and different pictures of Kings Canyon. And it was like so weird. I did this in 2015. And then in, um, yeah, last year I did it. So for me, the next thing over the next week is to do another, another like you can call it vision board or goal board. And my next five year plan is, yeah, to, to go back to study and, and build on this um, speaking thing I'm doing. I want to, sort of come up with um yeah i want to um it's yeah i haven't seen that photo for a while um <laughs> until this morning um yeah and maybe come up with some packages or workshops to do with people with resilience and you know lived experience it's it's slowly evolving but um yeah well that's, that sounds great and um hubby um yeah he's just plodding along uh he's a lawyer so he'll be um oh, yeah, yeah hopefully yeah. Some good jobs, but um, your, your secret is your secret is safe with me being you know being married to a lawyer. I, I know <laughs> lots of cops that are sleeping with the enemy. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, he's a litigation lawyer, it's okay. Ah, it's okay, yeah, no. And yeah. the criminal defense guys are great too. There's been a couple of times where I'm like, oh, maybe I'm gonna need one of them. <laughs> I really shouldn't, I really, I really shouldn't annoy them too much. Like, if something goes wrong at work, maybe I need to call one, yeah. but yeah, um, he's you know, I like. Chalk and cheese. He's very um, he's quiet. He's extremely humble, but um, you know I'm the the loud, talkative one. But he um, grounds me. Yeah. Oh, 
Thank God for that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you can't have two of me. They're a bit tough. You never. <laughs> <laughs> the world's not big enough, really, is it? <laughs> symptoms that maybe people don't know about or people who have gone through trauma and I think it's important for employers to know about it not not just in police I mean in general is when someone has a psychological injury their short-term memory is affected and I think that's also you know ties in with concentration and what you're doing and everything and I think um it's important for people particularly employees with people returning to work after that to understand that because the pressure that person puts on themselves is astronomical anyway because they know that there's an issue and you feel like you have now a um you honestly feel like you have a learning disability that's how it feels and you've gone from not having that issue to all of a sudden after a significant trauma you have that issue you you feel like your, your cognitive ability is completely changed and that is um extremely hard for someone who's recovering, you know, to get there in the first place, but realizing now they've got another battle on their hands to try and rework this or rewire that. And I think if employers are aware, aware of that and offer that support and they need a nurturing environment for that because they're under enough stress as it is. And, you know, there's something called sanctuary trauma, um, which was also discussed in that policing forum, but that, that that's that part. But I think, every person and every employment, you know, that's coming there, it's important for them to know that. And I think that's one of the other areas that um, some workshopping I'm, I'm wanting to work towards to deliver to, you know, organisations everywhere or workplaces everywhere is to give them that information and, and from lived experience about how to help that person. I think you might see a reduction in, in people off work or, or mental health. And that that's sort of that, study I want to do it's all sort of tying into that so that's I think that's one of the other things I need to mention.